Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> My name is uh, Joseph Gigante. I'm an academic general pediatrician in the Division of General Pediatrics at Vanderbilt Children's Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. And I'm also a member of the Practical Pediatrics CME Planning Group and director for this course. So welcome to all of you. This is gonna be a fantastic course. We're just so excited that we're able to present all this material to you and so excited that you're able to join us. So we're glad you're here. The course really is designed to highlight current issues in pediatrics and provide you with practical information that you can take back home and you can use in your office right away. And that's one of the reasons for the title for this course. This is not esoteric pediatrics. These are really topics and issues that you probably encounter on a daily basis. And we've got a panel of just esteemed experts who are just wonderful educators in addition to being terrific clinicians and will be able to give you some uh, important tips and clues and insights on how to deal with your patients when they present with some of the common problems we're going to be discussing this weekend. Before we get started, I want to begin with some housekeeping announcements, so bear with me. This is going to be the longest list of housekeeping assignments uh, or announcements that we have. This is typically at the very top of the course. This will take a few minutes. Um, so hopefully the link that you use to get here today is the only link that you will be able to use, need this week, and not hopefully, it really is. Anytime you click on the link, it will take you to the live course in real time. You may continue to access the online uh, on-demand materials from the course page on Pedialink. Simply uh, click on the sessions tab on the main course page to find the individual blocks or cards for each session. Click on the blue open button to open the session and click on the green view session button to view the lecture. Uh, from, it, the session, from, from the session cards, you'll be able to also download the session materials provided to you by our faculty. All the seminar rooms will open five minutes prior to the start of the seminar. So our first seminar will be at around 11. You'll be able to log in five minutes before then. All the sessions include the opportunity to submit questions for the faculty. Uh, thanks for those of you who have already submitted questions related to the on-demand lectures. Those are gonna be addressed in a few minutes in our opening question and answer session, as well as tomorrow morning's 10 a.m. question and answer session. Um, you're welcome to continue submitting questions related to these on-demand lectures. Simply click on the green questions for a faculty polling link in the session card to access the online question submission system. And that, the name of that system is called Conferences IO. Once you get there, be sure to click on the faculty member to whom you want to address your question before entering your question. If you prefer to have fewer browser tabs open, you can also access the question submission uh, system by using a separate device like your phone or your tablet. On your device, open your web browser and navigate to, the, this is the, where the site you navigate to, it's aapcme3.cnn as in Nick, F dot I-O. Either way you access the system, click on the session you are attending to submit your questions. Click the Ask button, type in your question, and click Submit. If you see a question that another attendee has asked and you want, to, you want it to be answered, you can upvote the question by clicking the icon to the left of the question. For those of you interested in obtaining uh, MOC Part 2 points available throughout the course, the pre-assessment test will remain open and available until 5 o'clock Central Time today. You must complete the pre-test the pre before that time. If you do not, you will not be eligible to earn and claim the MOC Part 2 points. Use the MOC assessment link on the right course, well, on the main course page to access the self-assessment. The post-assessment for this course will be available beginning tomorrow when the course ends at 5 p.m. So for those of you who haven't, haven't done the test, we'll have some break. There are breaks built in throughout the day. Go to go to the site, take the, answer the questions. Um, you, your grade doesn't really matter. As long as you take, uh, answer the questions and take the test that you'll be eligible to take the post-test and then get those MOC points. Please note that the MOC points available to diplomats of the American Board of Pediatrics are completely separate from the course's CME credits. You do not need to complete the MOC pre and post assessments in order to claim CME credit. Even if you're not seeking MOC points, you're welcome to participate in the MOC self-assessments as they provide yet another form of learning and another learning opportunity. You'll be able to claim your CME credit from this course beginning on Tuesday, June 12th. Once credit, once credit claiming is open, just click on the claim credit link on the top left corner of the main course page to claim your CME credit. 
You can only claim credit for the course one time, so please don't claim partial credit if there are more sessions for you to view and you plan to claim credit for them. Instead, wait until you've completed as much of the course as you intend to do, then claim the credit. Course evaluations are currently available through the course evaluations link. Please evaluate faculty in this course as we, as, as we do uh, use the feedback you provide to develop future courses. Naturally, we are uh, especially eager to get feedback on our virtual PPC courses. If you have technical issues or difficulty navigating the course pages, return to the course homepage. In the bottom right corner of the page, you will find a blue uh, needs assistance button. Click on that to open a chat with the AAP staff member. Finally, all seminars and questions and answers offered in real time this weekend will be recorded and posted on the course sessions pages. It will take a little time to edit and process the recordings. You, you though, uh, will receive an email message as soon as these recordings are available for you to access. All the presentation and sessions materials will be uh, uh, available, to you, available to you to access for a whole year until June 10th of 2022. You will have until that date to claim your credit, CME credit for the course as well. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for our faculty for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. So now we're gonna get started with our first question and answer session. Our faculty for this morning's question and answer session, Dr. Elise Berlin, Dr. Angela Hogan, and Dr. Miriam Weinstein. Thanks for all three of you for being here. And if you wouldn't mind, if, will each of you introduce yourselves um, who you are and where you practice. Dr. Berlin, you can get us started. Hi everybody, thanks for joining. My name is Elise Berlin. I practice in Columbus, Ohio. I work at Nationwide Children's Hospital and I'm on faculty in the Ohio State University College of Medicine. Dr. Hogan. Good morning, I'm Angela Hogan. I'm a pediatric allergist immunologist in Norfolk, Virginia. I practice at Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, and I'm also a professor of pediatrics at Eastern Virginia Medical School. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Weinstein. Hi, I'm Miriam Weinstein. I'm a pediatrician and dermatologist practicing pediatric dermatology at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada, and I'm also an associate professor at the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to be here and look forward to uh, hopefully interacting with, with you this morning. Wonderful. Thank you all for being here. So uh, for those participants, please, there are some questions in the conference I.O. Please type in more and ask more as the questions come in. I will put them forward to our panelists. So. I think we're going to start with our first question, Dr. Berlin, is for you. Um, it's gotten the most votes, it's gotten the most hits, it's got and hit for. So the question is, can you use traditional OTPs and tell the patient to skip the placebo for two months in a row so they have a cycle four times a year? Yeah, this is a great trick to have up your sleeve. You can absolutely do this. Um, the Practice tip would be to use a monophasic pill for this um, special trick, because if you use a triphasic pill, then um, the young person is gonna have varying levels of progestin and gonna be more prone to having irregular bleeding. So you wanna pick a nice um, kind of low dose pill, um, orthocycline slash Sprintec slash Milli, whatever the most recent generic of that is a nice choice. Um, and you can have the patient punch out the placebos and continue active pills. If you'd like to do a three month cycle like the branded Seasonique or Seasonal packs, that's great. Another trick that I do for my patients is to kind of um, make your own extended cycle. So they can really continue active pills until they are annoyed with breakthrough bleeding, as long as that's past you know, three weeks and can discontinue um, give themselves a three or four day break when they are troubled with breakthrough bleeding and then start after that brief hormone free interval that will not compromise the contraceptive uh, effectiveness and um, will hopefully help them have a longer um, time between their bleeds. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hogan, kind of a quite one of your sessions was related to allergy testing. And I think this is something being a, a general pediatrician myself, this is a common question that comes up when patients and families come in and they think their child 
has allergies and they want to do allergy testing. And I know this is something that you went over in your talk, but when these questions come to us as general pediatricians, what general advice do you have for us to answer that question for families? And what, if any type of testing, should a general pediatrician do in their office versus testing that's done with an allergist immunologist? Well, I think it depends on um, what you're sort of trying to gain. So, for example, if you have a patient who um, is coming in for food allergies uh, and they're concerned about food allergies, I think it's important to remember that the things that are the most important are that they get hives to the food, and those are the kinds of uh, diagnoses that would be more significant than particularly someone who says, you know, I get an upset stomach when I drink milk, or perhaps maybe um, they get a mild flare in their eczema. Those kinds of tests are um, probably less important um, unless the parent really feels strongly that they must have the test. I think a lot of reassurance and say, okay, well, if you get an upset stomach when you drink milk, then let's drink less milk. Um, I think a practical approach to testing is very important. I think when you're dealing with anaphylaxis, though, you do need answers and you need to know specifically what caused the episode. So I think testing would be more in order. And I'm perfectly fine when pediatricians go ahead and grab um, what they think is the specific blood test so that I have the answer when they come to me and, and maybe we can um, expound on that a little bit more. Or if they don't find the answer from blood work that they might have done, then I, I think that that also gives me some information. What we discourage though are just kind of random panels that are just a whole big group of tests because the mom comes in and says, oh, I think my child has food allergies and then the primary care provider orders a panel of 20. Uh, what happens when you do tests like that is you get a lot of false positives and families latch onto that information and oftentimes um, we start to compromise um, family quality of life and also nutrition. So I'd be cautious about that. When you think about testing for environmentals though, um, that can be very helpful, especially if um, there's a question about, you know, we're thinking about getting a dog or a cat. I think everybody in the pandemic wanted a new pet. So um, those kinds of tests from primary cares can be very helpful, at least in providing guidance and reassurance that there is no such thing as a hypogenic dog or hypoallergenic cat. So I think though reassuring them that the child may not be allergic before they purchase that animal can be helpful too. So um, I think testing is important for pediatricians to be able to reassure families and also to provide additional information like dust mite control or whatever, but we need to be cautious with the testing that we do and that we don't over test and that we don't overly interpret the tests that we get also. Do you have kind of a preferred uh, serum test if the PCP were to do a test in their office, a preferred uh, type of serum testing? So um, we used to do RAS testing, which was uh, a radio absorbent test that was radio labeled and everyone still calls the test today when we're looking for serum specific IgE or RAS test, but in reality it's really an ELISA. And I think if you're using major laboratories, um, most of them are doing very similar tests. Um, I think the consistency of, you know, knowing that it's a reliable lab is probably important. And I don't think it really matters whether you send, you know, a serum specific IgE to dust mic to Quest or to LabCorp. I think they're essentially reproducible and probably going to give you similar data. The testing's come a long way in the last 10 or 15 years. So I think in, even if your internal lab does them, they have internal controls that are established by CLIA that are going to make sure the testing is is reasonably accurate. Yeah, and it's interesting, Dr. Hogan, this is, you know, it'll, you brought up kind of uh, reactions to foods. I mean, there's, I think the GI upset, I think that sometimes parents interpret as having a food allergy, but you know, with the other instance or the other situation that comes up not frequently, this is where, it kind of where there's overlap in the dermatology world is, well, my, I fed my child strawberries and then they developed a rash. So how, right, because, and I see, I see Dr. Weinstein nodding her head, right? That's a common one that probably comes to both of you or you hear about at some point coming to your office. So again, it, it just general recommendations, is, is it 
okay to say, to recommend to the family, well, well, let's try it again. And if it happens again, come back and let me know, or we can come back and do some testing or come back if it happens again, and we'll refer you to a allergist immunologist or a dermatologist, or any kind of just obviously very broad general question, but what are your general recommendations in that type of scenario? So this is the case where I, this is the case where I love a cell phone. Uh, I'm so grateful for cell phones. I just tell them to take a picture of the rash that they have in question so that potentially if it recurs again, and I would let them go ahead and eat it at home again as long as it's not hives. If it's hives, I get a little more nervous. I probably don't want them to do that at home. Um, but even foods like, you know, strawberry and fresh tomatoes, for example, those foods are really high in histamine. So oftentimes we get a contact rash where they may uh, be touching in really sensitive skin of young young kids. So a picture is worth a thousand words. So I usually ask them to take a picture. If it's not hives, we can sort of talk through it. Or I think if the pediatrician looks at the picture and feels confident it wasn't hives, then I think it's reasonable to have them try the food again. There are lots of weird rashes, um, as I'm sure Miriam could say, um, that happen with food contact reactions. So uh, what are your thoughts, Miriam? So I think that um, this is a really complicated area and what makes it complicated is diagnosing eczema is really challenging. So we're asking families to, you know, tell us when you've had a flare of eczema or maybe hives or maybe one of these other weird rashes. And it, it can be really challenging. These are all itchy rashes. And how do you know an irritant contact from an allergic contact from, an, from a systemic allergy from a flare of eczema? What parents know is that their children has a rash again, or it's an itchy rash, or this thing seemed to make it worse. So I often spend a lot of time trying to work through with the family and, and the relationship between food allergies and or food and eczema is really complicated because lots of kids with food al with eczema do have food allergies but not everybody with eczema has food allergies and we we all we all have to eat and these rashes come and go so it really can be challenging so i use a lot of um i get families to use diaries to sort of mark when they had had the rash and mark when they ate certain foods if there's a question and i really try to isolate an irritant reaction from an allergic reaction. So foods that are high in acidity, so all the citrus fruits, so oranges, lemons, tomatoes, and all the tomato-based products, so ketchup, uh, tomato sauce, pizza, these all can easily cause an irritant reaction in a patient with atopic dermatitis, in anybody, but particularly somebody with atopic dermatitis, because the barrier of the skin is not intact. And so, yes, they're going to get the rash when they eat it. So now we have to sort out, was it a burning, stinging rash? Did it persist? Because urticaria do not persist. They will resolve within hours, whereas a dermatitic eruption is not going to resolve likely um, untreated for, for days, if at all. So we try to sort out what happened. Was it burning, stinging? Did it look like your classic eczema with flaky skin or with open scratches or was it the, a group of bumps that disappeared within a few hours so really trying to sort out getting photos when they when they can is very very helpful and trying to pinpoint was food the precipitant of a given reaction or not and I find with a, with a lot of time and really trying to work through that with families we often can narrow it down was it a particularly histaminic food was it an acidic food or do we really suspect that this food is causing you to have a food allergy, which should have maybe not on the first or every exposure, but we would certainly screen for systemic symptoms. And if somebody had difficulty breathing or, or vomiting immediately after, that would obviously be much more highly suspicious for an allergic reaction than an aggravating factor of their atopic dermatitis. Dr. Weinstein, we'll stay with you. This will be probably another kind of overlap question. I'm gonna pose it to you first, but Dr. Hogan, I'd like for you to chime in as well, is the question is, how long do you treat flare-ups of eczema and do you need to scale down from a moderate to a low potency uh, topical steroid treatment? Great question. So I'm gonna just give a, a one minute background before I answer the question. And I look at eczema treatment very much like making a chocolate cake. There's many, many, many different recipes out there. 
lots of different ingredients. You can make it vegan. You can put extra eggs in. It can be cocoa powder or melted chocolate. Many ingredients, many different methods. And most people are going to tell you that theirs is the best. And, and I think the reality is that most of these recipes are probably just fine and the outcome is probably going to be a delicious chocolate cake. So I'm about to give you what my preference is, but I think it's important to understand it's not a scenario with, a, with a, only one answer. I really uh, have a side interest in uh, health literacy. And there's a movement within health literacy to adopt sort of an, a universal precautions type of model where we assume that all patients have low health literacy. Now that might not be true, but if we assume that everybody has low health literacy, then we ensure that our instructions and our plans for patients are the simplest and the easiest to understand. And so that is sort of the background about how I approach eczema management. And there's so many things that we can tell people to do. And, and I've spent the early part of my career making recommendations about laundry soaps and environment and, and all of these different things. And at the end of the day, I think that there's actually very few steps in our routine that actually impact the outcome, which is to clear a flare rapidly and try to keep it clear because it's not a disease that we can cure. And it's important that patients understand from the outset that our goal is control, not cure. And for me, control means can we prevent flares with regular moisturization and reducing uh, triggers where they're identifiable, they're not always identifiable, can we treat flares when they come and restore the skin to the intact barrier, reducing itch and rash? And the answer is yes. But every step that I ask of a patient is one more brick in the wall of hurdle that we give them to actually put it into place. So with that background, I would prefer in most cases to pick one medication, um, use it two to three times a day, depending. Sometimes I'll do three times a day for three days and then drop it down to two and continue that until the flare is gone. So I like to get in, get the job done and get out. I don't like to change different products and step it up and step it down. Not because those are ineffective. They can be effective, but it's now it's a different thing. So when it's really bad, we want you to do this. When it's not as bad, we want you to do that. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's so easy to determine when something is really bad or not as bad. And most people declare a flare over far before it's over. They declare it's over when it doesn't bother them quite as much anymore and they don't feel the need to treat or they forget that they're in their, their mid-treatment. So, um, so I rarely do that. Um, but I think in select cases to, to ramp up or ramp, da ramp down, it's, it's not unreasonable. But I like to pick the strength that I think is appropriate for the degree of eczema that I'm treating, the body part that I'm treating, use it for sure twice a day from start to end of, of treatment. And again, sometimes jumpstart it by doing it three times a day for a couple of days to really get the bulk of it done quickly. But I'll pass it over uh, okay. now. Uh, okay. Dr. Hogan, what is your version of the chocolate cake that is eczema? Well, I like to add a little bourbon to mine and makes bourbon. it super good because I'm from Kentucky. No, um, actually, um, it's probably very similar. I um, try to limit it to, you know, for, uh, for me, I usually use a, a milder one maybe on the face and a stronger one for the body. Again, like Miriam said, the body part. And then I would add that, you know, the other thing too is that there's um, some good evidence that says if you have a body area that keeps flaring up all the time and you get it calmed down and then it's one that's going to flare again, there's some data that suggests you might even do kind of a preemptive strike Let's say the antecubital are the areas that always flare and you finally get them calmed down. Then I might advise my families also to put a little bit of preventive steroid cream there two or three times a week to kind of keep the inflammation down sparingly, of course, if these are the areas that are constantly reoccurring. But if I can keep them from flaring back again, then ultimately they're going to use less steroid overall than they would if I keep chasing the flare every time. So I think we're probably similar in our cake recipes in that um, I try to give them um, as much detailed information, but keep it simple um, so that they can understand the importance of restoring the barrier, the importance of applying um, 
water back into the skin and trapping it and then also having a easy anti-inflammatory routine that will help them um, be able to to heal the skin I think the bigger problem is is that you know there's so much you know they'll get information from so many different sources and even if they you know go to urgent care for a different reason someone will also then well I like to do chocolate cake this way um, and then I think the families get so confused over who's telling the truth and what's the best way um, and I, I do think they get this significant steroid phobia um, and so I think as you're discussing management you have to address that and sort of you know give them reliable resources um, so that they can you know feel like they have gotten an answer that is comfortable for their family and also has some evidence base to it. That's great, thank you. Um, you're right, and I, I think Dr. Weinstein, your analogy of the chocolate cake is so apropos because everyone does it just a little bit differently. And Dr. Hogan, I would have been disappointed if you hadn't added bourbon to your chocolate cake, so <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, Dr. Berlin, you've been quiet for a few minutes. I'm gonna maybe ask you a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, so the first one is, do you have a go-to OCP for acne? You know, do you have any concerns about prescribing Yaz or Yasmin given the class action lawsuits and report of increased risk of blood clots compared to other forms of OCPs? So I'm going to maybe steal a little bit from the chocolate cake analogy, which I, I think I'm going to like love forever. Um, so really any combination hormonal contraceptive, um, probably more than 20 microgram ethanol estradiol pill is really going to be fine for acne. So at the end of the day, I think all the pediatricians can go, Whoo! we're doing, you know, it's, this is not too complicated. I will say that my go-to pill is going to be um, a generic of orthocycline, um, like Sprintec, uh, Norgestimate is a nice, um, not very androgenic progestin, and Sprintec is so, or the generic of orthocycline, is so readily available. You know, with, um, with the prescription, most people around the country can pay cash, and it's going to be like 9 or $10 at Walmart or Target. So I like to think about that in terms of availability of the product. Um, but any kind of nice, I would say, you know, 30, 35 microgram ethanol estradiol pill is going to be fine. For acne. And the question about Yaz, yes. so I talk about this in my pre recorded one a little bit. You know, I think the evidence is concerning about blood clots, but I think we should all remember that any um, medication, oral medication containing ethanol estradiol, is going to kind of increase the vulnerability to clots. And so I know that the, I understand the evidence around drosperinone is a little bit um, increased compared to the earlier progestins. I think it can still be a nice product. It's not usually my first line pill. I use usually Yaz if I'm going to pick one of those as kind of my second line pill if I'm trying for a 20 microgram pill and a 24-4 regimen. Um, but I think it's okay to use it, but maybe not your first line. Gotcha. Let me ask you another one. Do you, is there a minimum age that continuous OCPs are okay, even starting at menarche? Yeah, this is a great question I get a lot from pediatricians. Once a young um, person has passed menarche, really any of these hormonal products are going to be safe and fine for them to use. Excellent. All right. Um, so, uh, Dr. Hogan, can, there's a question that's come up. Can you comment on phasing out use of Benadryl and using second generation um, antihistamines instead, even for like urticaria and anaphylaxis? I can actually. So um, some of the concern with the first generation antihistamines and what we mean by those are things like um, Benadryl or diphenhydramine or chlorophenhydrine. Um, those uh, particular antihistamines are sedating for a lot of individuals and so um, obviously it can impair their ability to drive or school or um, and in some young babies it can even make them very irritable and so um, that can complicate things if if we don't want the side effects from the medications but certainly having hives is uncomfortable and there's some good evidence that say the second generation antihistamines particularly things like cetirizine or fexafenidine or um, so Zyrtec, Allegra, um, Zizol, or uh, Levocetirzine, those uh, medications can be very helpful 
in urticaria. The most important thing is to use enough. Um, and that's something that um, all of us have been taught with well, the dose is 10 milligrams for cetirizine. But in urticaria, it may very well be 20 milligrams or it might be 30 milligrams in order to be able to get the urticaria under control. And we used to be worried about was there too high of a level. Um, some of the antihistamines that were out in the 80s and 90s had a prolonged QRS with it. So many of us older physicians were nervous about using higher dose antihistamines. But the current ones that are available on the market really don't have that as a predominant side effect. So I think we can feel a little more comfortable with using those. And then also in our action plans that we use for food allergies, um, you know, obviously the medication that stops anaphylaxis is epinephrine and not an antihistamine, but sometimes patients like to have an antihistamine available in order to reduce the hives or help them not itch as much. And so most of those action plans have diphenhydramine as the antihistamine there. But there's been some recent evidence that demonstrates um, cetirizine actually has the same onset of action as diphenhydramine does. So at least at our hospital, our action plan for food allergy has both um, diphenhydramine and cetirizine on it, and you can pick whichever one you like. I like cetirizine a little better personally. And by the way, both of them for the onset of action is 30 minutes. So the people that take it and say, oh, five minutes later, we were better, um, the antihistamine didn't have time to do anything or they're not very good at telling time. But um, in this particular case, I like cetirizine, especially in my young infants under 12 months, um, because I don't get a floppy, sleepy, or really super grumpy baby. I can sort of monitor them and know what's going on with them a little bit better. Uh, and also the antihistamine lasts 24 hours, which is nice if you're worried about the hives coming back as opposed to diphenhydramine, which, as you know, only lasts four to six hours in most individuals. So um, I think Benadryl will be around forever because it's inexpensive and um, people know it and, and are um, comfortable with it. Um, but I think there's certainly a great role for second generation antihistamines, um, especially for urticaria and potentially um, even on our action plans for anaphylaxis. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was not aware actually the onset of action of cetirizine is about the same as diphenhydramine. I mean, the kind of the teaching is that it, it, it takes a longer time for the initiation of onset of action. So the, thank you for not sharing true. that. Not true. Good. Another medical urban legend that's been dispelled. Thank you. Out of here. <laughs> Uh, and we're not old, older pediatricians, Dr. Hogan, we're more oh, experienced. Mature. Mature. Oh, I like that. Good. Dr. Weinstein, what are your recommendations? How long do you like to treat tinea capsis using terbenafine? So one of the things um, that I mentioned in, in the lecture and um, I really hold true is that I always do a culture, even if I'm treating on spec. If I look at a kid and I know this is tinea capsis, I still like to get my culture, and, and the reason is several fold. The first is, if you put them on an oral antifungal and they come back a month later and they're not a lot better, and now you're wondering, well, maybe it was subderm or psoriasis, maybe I got it wrong, and you decide to do the culture then, with that anti uh, um, fungal on board, an oral antifungal, there might be enough action left that you're going to actually get a false negative at that point. So, so it's always better to get the culture before you start. Um, if you're not sure and there's no alopecia, you could wait till the culture comes back, but it's reasonable to start on spec because they take a long time to come back. So one reason to do the culture is to do it later, um, you might not get the results you're looking for. The second reason to do it is that different organisms can require different treatment lengths. So for example, the microsporum species, which tend to have um, an animal reservoir as the, as the host versus the anthropophilic one, which tend to have human to human uh, um, source and reservoir. Uh, the trichophyton species are anthropophilic. They tend to be less inflammatory and come from a human uh, contact. And often two to four weeks is enough to treat. The microsporum species, which tend to be more inflammatory, there might be an obvious animal source, although not necessarily, it still could be transmitted from another human, they often need longer to clear. And so I'll often put patients who have come back with a microsporum on for an extra month, so for a total of two months. 
So what I typically do is I see a patient, if I, uh, you know, I, I think tinea capitis is in the differential, I take a culture, if I think it's likely, or there's alopecia, I will start treatment, I'll bring them back in a month, we'll review benefit, have they improved, and we'll review the results. If they're not completely better and it was a microsporum species, I'm going to give a second month of therapy. If they're completely better and it came back as a trichophyton species, I will probably stop therapy. Um, lots of patients, two weeks is sufficient, but not every patient is two weeks sufficient for the trichophyton species. So that's how I sort of determine what my length of therapy is going to be. And just always remember to ask if patients have had a travel history, even remotely. So I see a number of people who have spent time in Africa that come back with trichophyton violation years later, years after they've, they've had their travel. Um, and they just sort of perceive that they've had mild dandruff for years. Hmm. When in fact, when we culture it, it actually comes back as trichophyton violation. So um, the classic North American, most common one to see in North America is trichophyton tonsorans and microsporum canis is the second one. But just go for that travel history, or did you spend time in another country? Were you born in another country? Um, if they have a scaly scalp, and even if it's remote, I would for sure send a culture because species that we're not used to, sometimes I actually have to look up to, to see what my recommended length of treatment is because it's not an organism I, I treat all that often. So long-winded answer, but I hope that answers the different, the nuance of exactly how long um, to treat for. And just kind of a follow-up. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, being one of these uh, mature or uh, pediatricians, Dr. Hogan described, kind of, you know, kind of grew up with using griseal fulvent as my first, you know, first line for treating tinea capitis. Is that kind of still the case or do you prefer terbenafine over griseal fulvent, preference of one over the other? I, I think so. Here where I practice um, in Toronto, we can't even get griseal fulvent anymore. It's not that it's pulled from the market. It's just, I, I I'm assuming, I, I'm not aware of any uh, concerns that it was withdrawn from the market. I'm assuming it just doesn't have the same market share and so it's not readily available. I would say that terbinafine in many areas is the first line. It, in um, the US, it's FDA approved for, for H4 and above. Here it's not, it's just we use it off label all the time. Um, there's data for fluconazole and itraconazole as well, if there was some issue as to not use the terbinafine, but uh, again, they're both off-label, but with pretty good um, data. And of course, there's data on griseofulvin as well. Some studies show it might actually work a little bit better um, for certain species. So if it's available, it's still a reasonable treatment option. Um, but I would say that in many areas, terbinafine is the first go-to. Gotcha. Thank you. Dr. Berlin, um, question about what about using ibuprofen at the onset of menses for AUB? So ibuprofen can help a little bit. A non-steroidal can um, diminish bleeding maybe 10, 15 percent. So I think it for someone who is just slightly troubled um, and they may have a contraindication or a preference to not use a hormonal treatment, Perhaps there's a reason they're not interested in tranexamic acid. Ibuprofen is going to help the cramps, and it'll help um, a teensy bit. But I think in my, in my practice, for the degree of minimal improvement they would get, usually there's a better alternative we can, we can use. Gotcha. Um, Dr. Hogan's maybe kind of an overlap question with Dr. Weinstein, I think, with regard to eczemas. Can you explain the moisturization process, the best products to use. Uh, what about putting wet cloth over the moisturizer to trap the moisturizer? Also, can you talk about bleach baths for eczema? So actually several of those, if you stick around, um, and it's good lead into um, for the seminar at 1130, uh, we are going to cover several of these, but for those of you that uh, might like have be starving or something else going on. Um, so I can sort of um, discuss that. What we are understanding more and more about um, atopic dermatitis or eczema is that um, the barrier defect is very important 
And because of the breakdown in the epithelial barrier, it's hard for the skin to hang on to the moisture. And so when um, you bathe, um, you sort of like a sponge suck up all that water again. And it's really important that you trap that water as fast as you can in order to prevent the trans epithelial water loss and more drying out of the skin. So um, at least in the allergy world, most of us feel daily bathing is very important. Um, and that you apply the moisturizer, kind of a soak and smear, soak and seal, whatever your um, mnemonic is that you remember. But you want to trap that water as rapidly as possible um, with your topical agent so that you don't get the transepithelial water loss. In areas that are very lichenified, thickened, um, tough, um, very uh, rough, um, or even in areas that um, may have a significant flare. We in allergy do use a lot of uh, wet wraps. Um, and for those of you that may not do those, um, in my clinic, it means that after you have moisturized the area um, or put your topical steroid cream there, then you'll make like a gauze roll and kind of mummy that area. Um, wrap it with um, that Curlex or gauze, and then um, we usually try to apply something to hold it in place. And that additional moisturizer can help drive the steroid cream a little bit deeper into the skin and help reduce the inflammation and also hydrate that super dry area. Um, so we do use a lot of wet wraps in problematic areas, and, and you'll see some pictures of that in my slides. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about bleach baths. Um, the reason to do bleach baths um, are obviously um, Staph aureus is a, a, a common complicator of atopic dermatitis in that we are colonized with it and it can become um, very strongly over colonized um, in people who have active areas of eczema. And there's some discussion that bleach baths uh, or bleach itself can actually have uh, an anti-staph or anti-inflammatory effect. Um, if you look in up to date um, or um, look at some of the meta analysis for bleach baths, it's kind of a 50 50. Most people feel that, uh, or at least the experts in their meta analysis feel that the water is really the most important part and not necessarily the addition of bleach. Um, but you will find people who argue very strongly that you have to sift your flour before you put it in the cake and other people that will say you don't have to. So um, I think it's kind of a neutral point with bleach baths, but uh, it is very safe and a lot of families like doing something proactive. Um, and so we do encourage bleach baths in our practice um, for patients who it sort of fits in their um, presentation of atopic dermatitis. Yeah, Dr. Weinstein, any kind of comments on that? And, you know, it's interesting, you know, Dr. Hogan, you brought up the, you know, the frequent daily baths versus the infrequent baths. And it seems like that's been kind of a question that's been bounced around back and forth for, it seems like, forever. So, um, so yeah, Dr. Weinstein, I don't know if you want to chime in on kind of your perspective on that question. Sure. So, um, I get a lot of families who say we've tried like seven different moisturizers and none of them work. Um, what's the best one? And I really ask them, I reframe the question for them and I'll, I'll say to them, well, what were you asking of the moisturizer that it didn't do? Well, it didn't make the eczema better. And so I help them to understand that the main role of moisturizer is a prevention strategy. It's not therapeutic. Now, if somebody has very minimal eczema, it probably will be therapeutic. But for most moderate or moderate severe eczema, they're going to need more than moisturizers. So if they're applying it to an excoriated dermatitic plaque and it's not getting better, well, this moisturizer doesn't work. I'm going to try something else. And people come in with bags of, you know, six or seven different things. So I think for me, the starting point is helping them to understand that it's, um, it, it's part of the prevention uh, part of eczema management, less so than the therapeutic. So you're really using it all the time, whether you're flaring or not, that's going to be the chief thing that, that gets done. And so even if someone has a long stretch of clearance, we still want them using moisturizer. So number one is helping them to understand the role. It's, it's a tool. So when am I supposed to use this tool? The second thing they have to understand is that it's not a savings account, it's a pay-as-you-go card. So you can moisturize every day for six months and miss one day, and it is like you've never done it before. 
And that's because we're always shedding our stratum corneum. We're supposed to be new cells come up, they rise up the epidermis, old cells are shed, and those old cells are going to take with it whatever residual moisturizer you had on it. So lasting longer than about a day is probably not going to happen. Maybe if there's a super duper one, you'll get a little bit more than a day. And so understanding um, that it needs to be done all the time. And that's a drag for people. It's not that it's a complicated task and it's not that it's time consuming, but getting people to do this regularly is a huge hurdle because it's it's just one more thing to add to people's daily list of things they have to do. So understanding that for people and helping them to understand this is why you need to do it every day because missing a day, it's like you've never done it before. That's number two. And number three, I really operate um, when it comes to things touching the skin, less is more. And so a moisturizer that has the fewest ingredients as possible that will do the job of sealing the skin in is my preference. And that's petrolatum. There's nothing in it. It's just petrolatum. It seals moisture in better than anything else. And many, many moisturizers have petrolatum as a part of it. Now, there are a lot of people who are concerned with using a petroleum byproduct. And so there's now a number of products on the market that are like non-petroleum, petroleum jelly. They're very similar. And I'm completely uh, fine with people using those instead. So understanding that it's, it's a preventive strategy, using something that doesn't irritate the skin, because kids in active flare, everything irritates them, sunscreens, fabrics, uh, moisturizers, and understanding that it needs to be a daily, a daily task to trap that moisture in, because their skin, if they have eczema, unfortunately was not programmed in such a way that the moisture will stay trapped in, which is true of those of us who, who don't have eczema. So that's sort of my, my um, thinking on, uh, on moisturizers. I do, in very select patients, use bleach baths or wet wraps. Um, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't say I use it routinely, but I think there's definitely patients um, that I have where they play a role. And, and my reason for not doing it in most patients is simply to keep the routine very, very uh, simple. If I can get them to moisturize every day, and appropriately and adequately treat the active areas, meaning the medication at the first sign of a flare used consistently every single day until that flare is gone, not almost gone, not a lot better, but gone. I put up most of my energy into those two things, but there are certainly patients who need for focal areas or, or, or frequent infections, those other tools as well. Thank you. Um, a question, a new question that came in, Dr. Weinstein, you, Carissa, uh, you started in infants. Is there a duration after which you decide to stop and does it need any kind of taper? So uh, that's Chris Aboral. For those of you uh, attendees who may not know, it's, a, it's probably the, the most recent of the eczema treatment products on the market. It's a non-cortisone based um, phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor uh, in an ointment base. Um, its indication is BID dosing, and again, it, if if somebody's using one of the non-cortisone-based treatments, um, again, it should be used from the start of a flare to the end of a flare. And I would say if that clears patients fast and well, and they tolerate it well, I, I don't know that they would um, need to stop it. It could be used for subsequent flares. Um, if it's not working, so if somebody's using it properly and the flare is going on and on and on and it doesn't seem to be getting better or it gets to a good point but no further, uh, then I would probably switch back to a cortisone-based um, product. And for the same reasons as I answered for the first uh, question, I don't taper because um, I just I want the job done. I find tapering leads to what I call chronic disease maintenance. It keeps the active flare active as opposed to really trying to get it done and gone. So, um, but again, different ways of using things. And if somebody were to put a patient on a taper for a particular reason, um, as long as the key is that the family understands when am I supposed to ramp up or down? Um, why am I doing that? And what am I changing to? So I don't tend to use it, but there may be a role in some patients. Uh, Dr. Berlin, question for you. Um, can you use the patch or NuvaRing continuously to skip periods? 
Yeah, so that's a good question. You can use any combination hormonal contraceptive product continuously. A couple cautions um, or points. Nuvering is actually effective past the 21 day um, label. So Nuvering you can actually keep in for a month, um, a full month. So I have patients who choose to use Nuvering who do keep it in a full month and just change it once a month. And that does not compromise the contraceptive efficacy. Um, it has a low, um, uh, the ethanol estradiol dose is low on that one. So that's a great one to continuously cycle. I do have some patients who are interested in continuously cycling the patch or an extended cycle. I think the concern with the patch is around kind of exposure to estrogen um, and the, um, the dose of estrogen that um, is experienced by the body with the patch is a little bit higher um, than with the um, ring and with the usually used pills. So I'm a little cautious and I don't love an extended cycle with the patch, um, just around the risk for blood clots. It's not absolutely contraindicated, but I think it, it may increase a person's risk for a blood clot. So not my, not my first choice, but it's not absolutely wrong to do. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hogan, um, again, an another question in the eczema world. Um, what's the best way to manage the itching in eczema, especially in infants? Well, I think the thing that I would want you to know, first off, is that the itch of eczema is not histamine mediated. Um, there are very good studies that show it's actually mediated through a different cytokine, IL-31. And so I think um, using tons and tons of antihistamines to try and stop itching may not be terribly helpful. Um, sometimes we'll use the sedating antihistamines and I guess theoretically you could snow the child enough to where they're so sleepy with the uh, diphenhydramine that they're less likely to scratch. Um, but that's probably not the optimal way to manage the itch either. I think the best ways to manage the itch are to try to get at helping improve the disease if you can. Um, but I also use something else called scratch me knots a lot in really young infants. And what scratch me knots are, are this ingenious product that this mom created that if you remember like the infant gowns, how you can turn the hand part over and then the hand's not available. So this particular product, which is available on Amazon and I own no stock in it and there is no other name for me to call it. It's just called a scratch me knot. But um, what it does is it's a sleeve that you can put over the hand. It goes all the way around the back and to the other side and it can go under clothing. And so in my infants and in my toddlers, you can actually kind of help cover the hands and there's still enough space that they can still pick up their bink and do other stuff, but the nails are not as readily available for them to be able to claw at themselves um, and be able to scratch as much. And so I've had really good success um, in kids who chronically scratch a lot of kind of taking the fingers out of it so that um, they're less likely to scratch some. Um, and then, obviously, um, if they're super, super scratchy and just can't seem to get a handle on it, sometimes I tell families to go put them in the bathtub. Um, and that the water can be, for some of those kids, soothing if it's appropriate, you know, temperature and length of bath and so forth. And then, um, and then as soon as they come out again, try to trap the water that you just put in the skin with your topical agents. I know at um, National Jewish Hospital in Denver, they have an eczema camp um, and an eczema program there where some of the most severe eczema patients in the country will come there for eczema management. Um, and in their program there for eczema, sometimes they'll bathe those kids two or three times a day um, in order to soothe the skin, rehydrate it, and then trap it again. So um, I tell a family if they just can't get them to stop scratching sometimes, go put them in the bathtub. Um, and then that may also help with the itch. Be curious, Miriam, how do you manage the itch of eczema? So I really um, go aggressively after um, the skin disease, and, which is, which, you know, as you said, is sort of the source of the, of the itching. 
And what I find is really a challenge, and this isn't just a challenge for families and for patients, it's even a challenge for the trainees that I have in my clinic, which is, where is the eczema? So subtle eczema, it's easy to find obvious eczema, but subtle eczema that may just present as itch or a rash that's palpable, so there is no visible erythema, um, sometimes that's the source of the itching and parents will say, but I'm not, I know why the rash is itchy. I understand that and we need to treat the rash, but I, she, she's itching all over. There's no, there's, she's itching areas that don't actually have rash. So we have an eczema, um, uh, uh, atopic dermatitis uh, clinic, uh, special sort of school here as well. And what we do for all the patients when we see them, uh, once we've confirmed that it's uh, atopic dermatitis, and usually these kids have itch all over and spotty areas of rash. Um, we'll actually do a treatment for the first two weeks. When we see them back in two weeks. We treat with a, a mid-potent cortisone from the neck down, and it just goes everywhere. We take away that need to try to figure out what's active disease, what's inactive disease, um, because kids who are spotty everywhere, probably the intervening normal skin probably is threatening to bubble through with their eczema. And for the face, we will use a milder one. So we sort of do chin up with a mild cortisone, neck down with a mid-potent cortisone, always done in an ointment base, spread everywhere for two weeks. We add an antibiotic in if there's signs of infection. And I'm going to say almost everybody is clear. They're sleeping better. They're happier. They're less irritable. We start to see their adenopathy settling down. Um, we even see weight gain in some of these kids whose, whose weight was suppressed. They're just happier. That's actually not the challenge. The challenge is keeping them in that controlled state because from that point forward, now we direct it at focal treatment. So now you're not treating everything. We now want you to just treat the areas um, that, that break through. So two times a day, strip your baby down. Look for obvious eczema that's red or violaceous or thickened. And then also feel. So when people describe dry patches, that's eczema. People who have dry skin, it's dry everywhere. So if you have dry arms, the whole arm should be dry. If it's patchy dryness, it's probably subclinical eczema. And so we tell them, we want you to treat any area where you see a rash, where you feel a rash, or where there's itch, even in the absence of rash. And if those areas start to populate the whole or most of the body or much of the body or a lot of the body, go back to your full uh, treatment. And so I would say that our program is primarily focused on um, transferring those decision-making skills to families. How do we know? We can't know what to treat with or how to treat or which product if we don't even know where to treat. And I find that that's one of the biggest barriers in successful management. Patients will come back and parents will say that um, we treated it, but it came right back again. And when we point it out, we'll see large swaths of area that have really subtle eczema that actually wasn't treated. So it's a small point, but I, I, I think it's a really uh, critical point in aiding. And these babies, they just improve so fast and so well. Uh, Dr. Weinstein, another question uh, about, there was a question that came in about uh, ceramides. Are, are the products with ceramides as valuable as the advertisement suggests? Is the question. So, ceramides are added to moisturizers. Um, if you look at the science behind it, eczematous skin is, um, one of the pathophysiologic features is that there um, can be low ceramides. So, it, it makes sense if you add those ceramides back in, it might help with the barrier. The problem is it doesn't have durability or longevity any more than the base of the moisturizer does. In that moment, it may well enhance the barrier um, because of the ceramides. But the things to keep in mind is um, ceramide dysfunction is not the only dysfunction. It's not the only thing going wrong with the barrier in eczema. And number two, the question that, that I've asked that the literature doesn't answer so well is it, it makes sense that those ceramides may well help one of the underlying pathophysiologic problems in the skin, but does it do it better than just a barrier that keeps the moisture trapped in? And there's one published study I'm aware of that actually showed that at the end of the day, petrolatum works better than all of them. I don't know if that's been replicated. It's already 
that data is, I think, probably about eight to ten years old. Um, so scientifically, there's there's a reason why it might work, but practically, I just haven't seen in the literature other than that study, which, which supports my premise, that it's really superior to um, a bland emollient used regularly and consistently. But I don't have a problem with it if patients prefer to use those. Okay. Uh, Dr. Berlin, if uh, for patients with heavy menstrual bleeding and mild anemia who kind of refuse to take the pill, is the patch an alternative to start for that reason, or do you prefer a shot of Depo? Oh, love this. Okay, so there are so many options to treat heavy menstrual bleeding, and we go through those in the talk. The pill is not the most, most effective option. Actually, a levonorgestrel hormonal IUD has been demonstrated to be the most effective option to treat and reduce heavy menstrual bleeding. So when I, so in the talk, we talk about management in the acute phase and then kind of more middle term to long term management. In the acute phase, an oral combination hormonal contraceptive that's monophasic or um, we talk about a couple of progestins are going to be the best treatment. Once your patient's out of the um, acute kind of danger phase or out of her anemia, um, really transitioning to any type of hormonal treatment that's going to suppress menstruation, if that's the primary aim, is really going to be acceptable. So Depo is a, is a nice option. Um, hormonal IUD is a nice option. And hopefully your, the attendees have those options available where they live. There's now Sub-Q Depo, which a patient or a family member could self-administer. Um, so really a, a broad amount of treatment options depending on um, your patient's preferences and also whether or not they have a need for an ongoing contraceptive. And I was going to, if I can add, I, I wanted to add this about um, the blood clots. I think we are, there is a national awareness now around blood clots. And I think especially after um, the experience with the vaccine and the emergence of um, cavernous sinus thrombosis and those problems. Um, I love to remind the attendees that a woman's highest risk of having a blood clot is during pregnancy or in the immediate postpartum period. And so everything that we talk about is relative with regards to thinking through the use of combination hormonal contraceptives and blood clots and really weighing it. If, if we're talking about using it as a contraceptive, really what is her risk of having a blood clot in the state of pregnancy or in the postpartum period. And so really in most, most of the time, or in every, in every instance, it's actually gonna be safer to use a combination hormonal contraceptive product um, in terms of relative risk. So I just always like to think as the, as the clinician who's writing the prescription, I counsel all my patients about blood clots and I document that I do that. Um, I let them know they're gonna see information online about blood clots and that I do recommend it as a safe option for them. Thank you. All right, we've got a little over two minutes left before the end of our question and answer session. So a question has kind of come in actually for both Dr. Weinstein and Dr. Hogan. So in the remaining two minutes, your thoughts on oatmeal baths or baking soda in uh, you, you adding those to baths for those children with eczema. I tend to not use them regularly unless the patients tell me they really have some additional comfort from them. I think it can be drying. Okay. I agree. Very good. Okay. Um, we've got, I said, a little over a minute left. Maybe this is kind of a question that we kind of talked about yesterday, but maybe, maybe if each of you can take about 30 seconds to talk about what has been the biggest impact in your field with COVID and your patient population. So Dr. Berlin, maybe you can go first. What's been like the biggest issue experience uh, that adolescents of COVID? All right, I'll, I'll do my best to stay in my time. So I, you know, telehealth has been great for reaching adolescents where they are. So there's so many types of visits that one can do, particularly in the emotional well-being, um, in uh, Follow-up visits, I think, for hormonal problems, bleeding problems. I think the challenge is, big, and we can talk about this um, hopefully some other time, maybe in the lecture, uh, seminar later today. The challenge is really how to deliver confidential and sensitive and personal care kind of over telehealth. And I think we're all learning about that. 
Dr. Hogan? I think telehealth probably was a big thing. I think the other thing that was really surprising for me is with my asthmatics and that the fact that they were at home, they wore masks when they were out in the world, they are away from germs. Uh, we really didn't see much of a flu season. We really didn't see a severe asthma flares that we expected to have. And then we know that allergic individuals actually had some protection against COVID. So it wasn't what I expected. Dr. Weinstein? Uh, also telehealth, um, it was great that for the most part, we did not have to stop providing care for families when there were so many other challenges that families were going through. Um, telehealth is not always the ideal method to manage skin disease, but it often provided at least some answers and a little bit of comfort until we could bring them in. And um, it's opened a whole new world that I suspect will continue with patients sending photos in. And for those of you who, who also have that in your derm or non-derm patients, there's some great websites that families can use to actually help them learn how to take a photograph so that um, they're, they're, it's optimal when you're seeing it as it's as though you were seeing it in person. So I encourage you to, to look up those. Excellent. Dr. Berlin, Dr. Hogan, Dr. Weinstein, thank you so much. This was an absolutely fantastic session. Great questions, audience. Uh, thank you for your expertise. We're going to end the session now. So we'll have about a half an hour break. We'll be back at 1130. So the first seminar of the day, Dr. Hogan will be back. If you didn't have enough eczema earlier, she's going to talk about eczema. Uh, mischief, mischief Managed is the title of her talk. And I would also encourage uh, participants, tomorrow morning's uh, question and answer session will be on the emergency medicine, gastroenterology and sports medicine pre-recorded talks. Please Enter your questions in the conference INO, and we will post those questions to those faculty tomorrow morning. Um, thank you. We're off to a great start, and we'll see you at 1130 Central Time. Thank you.